Hong Kong versus Sweden coming up next as finally Dan and Dana are reunited on the casting desk. When did we last cast a series together, Dan? Uh, well, it wouldn't have been last Global Games, would it? That Surely we've done a tour stop. Italy? That'd be crazy. We didn't cast together cast in Italy. together in Italy. So would it have been Global Games finals last year? Potentially. We may have done the WSG together or some other event like that, but that's crazy. I've missed you, Dan. I've missed you too, Dan. Let's do this. Hong Kong versus Sweden. Both teams do have the four wins they needed in order to qualify in theory, but I'm sure given the news today in which one or two of the teams aren't going to make it, they're still going to be pretty keen to get this win. Yeah, tiebreakers are extremely important. Uh, Sweden did get a buy in their previous round so they will definitely want to make sure they right. can get a victory to make sure their tiebreaker is better. Well, if they get five wins, they're definitely through. At least we can solidly say that. Uh, but the scary thing is, if you do lose, there is that potential chance. But both these teams should be feeling fairly confident. They are neither of the side that has the incredibly bad tiebreakers that we do see on some of the sides in the global games. Should we take a look at these two teams and see who's representing them? As usual, Hong Kong, Blitzchung, Kin, Lucefield, and Shai versus Sweden. Sweden who, by the way, Norway, we're just saying in the uh, previous series, they believe is a free win for them if they get matched against Sweden later. But Boston, Orange, Arcade and Kenobi representing that side. Very strong teams indeed. I do like it when uh, players do throw some choice words across and try and get a little bit of banter on the go. But I mean, Norway and Sweden, you know that they are good friends at heart. And we would love to see the match up against one another. But at the same time, I would love to see both teams get even further, potentially. Uh, but there is a good chance that both of these teams, Hong Kong and Sweden, could both qualify for the top 16 as well. So we might see them at the latter stages as we look at some of the gl glorious and gorgeous sights of Sweden. Oh, there's some snow there. No, there's not. That was... There was, was there snow? There, there was snow. Oh, okay. What is it with you and snow, anyway? I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, worth noting here, I guess, Dusky Boys practice group, Hunter Ace from Team Norway is in the Dusky Boys group, Boston and Orange are also in that practice group, both of which competing for Sweden. So being in a practice group together, playing a lot of games together, it does help in a tournament like this as we take a look at some picks and some bands. Yep, of course, this is an extremely important phase. You want to get rid of the best decks that, well, the better decks that play well against your decks as both teams decide to take away the warrior. And I'm not entirely surprised there is a little bit of aggro on both sides. So the odd warrior typically does so fantastically well against those kind of decks. I want to slow down there, Dan. You went back on yourself there. You started that by saying, yeah, you want to start by getting rid of the best decks. And then as soon as you saw Warriors, you went, oh, actually, no, just the best decks for these matchups. Well, Dan Gaskin, I'll have you know, I think Warrior is one of the best decks. Uh, I mean, arguably, on ladder, it is right now. I mean, there is a lot of aggression, especially at the start of the season. So people are going to be trying to bash through with Odd Rogue, with Odd Paladin, with Zulok. Odd Warrior does very well against all three of those decks. So yeah, okay, maybe you're right for once. It is a very good deck. Let's take a look though at how these classes have fallen into place. First up is going to be Blitzchung on the Token Druid versus Boston on the Aggro Mage. Now, Dan, we've had some varying opinions, I think, on Aggro Mage <laughs> across the different casters over the last few days. Where do you stand on the deck? Uh, I mean, the deck in itself does a very good job at what it's supposed to do. It aggressively beats decks that are slow. It has a lot of burst damage. I am not a big fan of Aggro Mage uh, because I feel like it's not the most skillful deck in the world. And I say that with a, with a tiny pinch of salt because there are situations where Aggro Mage becomes very difficult. I'm talking about those situations where, like, it's not hard when you get Mana Worm into Frostbolt into blah, 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 blah. The game plays itself. However, when you don't have that easy gift of just tempo, you are going to struggle a bit. And especially in matches like this against the Token Druid, a Druid that is able to gain a lot of armor, you do need to try and save back that face damage for the right things. Like, are you going to be trading? Are you going to be sending it face? It all becomes a little bit more awkward. We've talked a lot as well about how Token Druid is such a good anti-aggro deck. It's good at putting up these tools, putting up the taunts, putting up small minions, having spell stones for removal, etc, etc. And as you said, branching paths, 
Uh, it's pretty good at gaining armor. Um, these are some slightly different versions of the deck, actually. Hong Kong, for example, running one copy of Strong Shell Scavenger, as opposed to the two, one copy of Saranite, and... And a copy of Naturalize as well. That's the extra card, the yeah. Naturalize. Okay, yeah, so I think this is the original version of the list, because Tyler said that he removed a Naturalize and added in a Strong Shell because he felt like Strong Shell was doing very well and Naturalize wasn't. But I think the original version of the list was, yeah, one Naturalize, one Strong Shell. And on the other side for the Mage, we see we saw in the Mulligan a Flame Geyser as well available for the Mage just to try and find a little bit extra damage. It's just the one copy though, not two. It means they're only running one Arcane Intellect and one Counter Spell, whereas usually you would see uh, typically two of one of those. Very aggressive Mulligan there from Blitz Chunk. He even threw away at Naturalize, which I'm always a little bit surprised to see. When you see Naturalize in a Druid's opening hand, especially with the coin, uh, at least I expect to keep to see it kept most of the time, but I guess against an aggressive deck like the Agro Mage, Double Spellstone, it's worked out. Yeah, uh, you don't want to be given the Aggro Mage cards, even though that it is nice to keep back a little bit of removal in case a Mana Worm gets out of control, but Spellstone should do that job anyway. And now, already, we are in that position for the Aggro Mage of, oh, I don't have Mana Worm. Where's my Mana Worm? <laughs> so what, now what is my plan? How am I going to be able to find that damage? Am I playing Thanos onto the board now to try and get a little bit more card draw? Because my opponent is typically going to remove that. Whereas you give up the spell damage, and as they have arcane missiles and shooting star in hand, that seems a little unfortunate. None of these plays seem ideal, though. The alternative is what? Ping face? I think Thanos is the way to go, but it doesn't seem good. Then again, but its Chung doesn't exactly have the most blisteringly fast start either. Yeah, and it means that Sweden have two draws for a Kirin Tor Mage if this Thanos does get destroyed, and True. that would just generate a lot of pressure. Instantly, being able to play that plus a secret it has to be explosive runes because that's all they have in their hand. Uh, but Mana Worm ah, works. There as we well. go. There's the boy. Is Mana Worm a boy? Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's either sex really. Huh. I guess there are probably both male and female Mana Worms. Yeah, I should so probably I don't, just uh, open up my mind a little bit. Yeah, I don't know what that particular Mana Worm is, Dan. <laughs> I also don't know his name, but I did just call him a he. So there you go. Yes, he's a boy. Well, he's Fred. Ah, well, then that makes a lot of sense. He's Paul the Murloc's Mana Worm friend. Ah, uh, yeah. Paul and Fred. Every Murloc has to have a Mana Worm friend. Of course. Uh, but now, Mana Worm into Frostbolt, even though it looks nice on your Mana Curve, do you really want to just want to be sending a, a Frostbolt to face here? Maybe just Mana Worm ping? Yeah. I mean, I'm really hesitating there. No, he is going to go with a Frostbolt. See, I was looking at the secret and thinking maybe that was the... Well, because that was the like, most, I guess, mana-efficient play, but there you go. He is going to go ahead and Frostbolt the face. I guess the advantage to this is that this Mana Worm now cannot be hit by Spellstone Hero Power. So the Mana Worm's sort of protected. The only thing I think that outright destroys it is Naturalized or two Spellstones. Or Coin Swipe, potentially, yeah. could yeah, be true. enough as well. Hmm. Uh, but for Sweden here, they just want to be able to put minions on the board. They're going to be finding some damage now before... Spreading Plague starts to come down, and then suddenly they're not going to be able to find any damage with their uh, minions at all. So try and get a Mana Worm that sticks. Try and generate a little bit of pressure early on. Hmm, Lots of talk going on for this turn, though. Like, wh what are we thinking? Are we thinking coining out Whispering Woods, going wide? Will mean that over the next few turns we have what we need in order to actually clear up anything Sweden plays, but then that's very weak to a card like, to, to cards like Arcane Missiles and Cinderstorm. It is, and it, it feels like a strange matchup when you are playing the Token Druid because you feel like you should be unfavored because you are typically going to struggle against Arcane Missile Shooting Star. Uh, but then when you do get to those later turns and suddenly Giggling Inventor comes onto the board, you have the potential for Spreading Plague. You just need to find Malfurion and Branching Pass, and you pretty much just win this game because the armor gain is too much for the mage to get through unless they find something miraculous from a Primordial Glyph. The lack of minions in Token Druid can actually make things a little bit tricky to play around Explosive Rune as well, though, because Giggling Inventor is a 2-1. That means when it gets played, Hong Kong take 5 damage from the Explosive Runes. That's not necessarily something that they can always afford to take, and the only other minion minions in the deck are the Strong Shell, the Floop, and the Arcane Tyrants. So they're not exactly spoiled for choice of what they can proc the secret with. And they will have to worry that maybe it's a counter spell mm -hmm. as well. And that becomes a little bit more scary. You do have the coin at least to uh, yeah. try and test for that one. So it's not as intimidating early on. 
So maybe you feel like this is definitely an explosive runes because you'd say, well, why would my opponent play a counter spell if we just have a coin in hand anyway? Hmm. Does wasting the coin disrupt their play at all? Though that's the question. Because yeah, Hong Kong, look, Blizzchunk's face there. He's like, okay, I need to work out the different possibilities here. Can I afford to just dump the coin? What is my play if it is counterspell? What is my play if it isn't counterspell? The branching paths, so to speak, of this turn. Because naturally, counterspelling a coin is quite nice going on a turn four because you are essentially just stopping a nourish. Uh, but in this instance, I don't think it's going to matter too much. It looks like Blitzchung is going to have to use one of these spell stones just to try and deal with this 4 3. He'll then be told, okay, it's not counter spell. Phew. Yeah, I think he'll be alright with that. As is pretty standard nowadays, though, um, Sweden are only running one copy of counter spell in the deck, so chances are always a little bit more in the favor of being explosive runes. Bit of a risk there, but I, I guess if it was Counterspell, Hong Kong were fine. They could have just played the second Spellstone and still dealt with it. But this is where the matchup starts to get really miserable for the Aggro Mage, where the Token Druid has been able to find its pieces of removal. The Aggro Mage hasn't been able to build up a scary enough board, and now Blitzjung has the possibility to start gaining armor. And mana as Nourish is picked up off the top there. I mean, just playing Nourish and Spellstoning down that Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, that works. Looks good from where I'm sitting. It sets up for future turns with Branching Paths, with Whispering Woods, with, with the Giggling Inventor. Hmm. Is there something better they can do, though? They, they could also Spellstone, Branching Paths, and gain armor, but that doesn't seem necessary right now. It's how much you want to draw through your deck as well. You could even consider Nourish for cards here. You could play the Coin and the Spellstone first. Oh, that's true. And then yeah. draw. Because Malfurion is really important. I know, yes, you are putting yourself a turn away further from Malfurion, but the fact you have other delay tactics before him anyway, it's something they'll be discussing, I'd imagine. No, you're right. I mean, gaining mana doesn't actually seem that impactful here when all of their cards cost five or less. Hmm. Time waits for no one. They're just going to go wide instead. Yeah, going down the aggressive route, they know there's not a counter spell in play, so they can play the Power of the Wild. This is devastating for Sweden. I hadn't spotted this play, but Power of the Wild just shuts down any missiles in the stormy goodness. And you need, like, a Glyph, really, to be able to deal with this board effectively. And no Glyph available. Kirito Mage can't even be played with another secret, because Explosive Runes has been played around by Blitzchung. Arcane Anomaly may have been okay that turn into the Shooting Star and the Arcane Missiles. May have dealt with... Yeah, that would have been nice. ...with, what, five of them, but... <laughs> It just shows how strong this combo is in a situation like this. Well, look, look at this. Boston's just going to have to drop Arcane Missiles and hope that it deals with at least one. Yeah, you Arcane Missiles and then you you follow up with Shooting Star Ping. Hope you can remove enough and be safe on the board from a Savage Roar or a Branching Paths. Okay, this positioning's fine for a Shooting Star on the left side of the board there and pinging away the 2-2. Two -two. However, I say fine. It still leaves Blitzchung with three Wisps on the board, and that's if Boston trades. And, Boston, and Blitzchung has Savage or Branching Pass, doesn't have the mana for them yet, but does have both cards available. I think you do have to trade. Oh, you are scared of double Savage Roar here, but uh, how are they going to win this game if they do trade? So they, that, that makes a lot of sense. They never beat double Savage no. Roar now from this position onwards. And it would have been just short of lethal, actually. One off. Yeah, would have been 28. <laughs> One off lethal is still pretty much lethal in a situation like this. It's still scary. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the druid does just take that damage when they offered it as well. 13 to go. Though, as we can see, it's actually a lot more than 13 needed for Sweden to finish off Hong Kong here. Yeah, Hong Kong should be starting to feel relatively safe now, even at 13 health, because they have the branching pass. Uh, and they have a spell that can be just thrown into a counter spell if a counter spell is to come onto the board as well. Uh, which is probably what they'll do. I would imagine this turn we'll see either Wild Growth being played into, what, Savage Roar? Or if they have Lethal or Branching Pass just for armor. Uh, Savage Roar's not quite lethal. But Savage Roar Swipe is. Yeah. So it's whether you start with a swipe 
Savage or Swipe or Savage or Branching Paths are both lethal here, so uh, it's just a question of which. Actually, yeah, you start, with the, you start with the Savage Roar. Start with the Savage Roar, that answers the yeah, question, yeah. and this is easily going to be the lethal that Hong Kong needed. As predicted, Token Druid took this one very nicely. Boston not looking too happy about that. But hey, that's the matchup. It wasn't the matchup they were wanting, no. that's for sure. When you're bringing Aggro Mage, you're hoping to hit something like, uh, well, Quest Rogue, obviously, but even against, like, Zoo, against Odd Paladin, you still have a chance with the Aggro Mage, but that is just miserable. Against any Druid in general, they're just able to build up far too much armor. It can get really scary. I mean, you have probably more chance against, like, a Maligos Druid, potentially, because they have less of the early game answers, but still a tough one. Should we take a look at what's coming up next? Let's. It is going to be Loose Field on the Control Priest versus Orange on Mali Ghost Druid. So let's sit back and relax because this could be a long one. Yeah, it could be. Uh, Orange is very well known for being able to pilot Mali Ghost Druid very successfully. So you've, you're you probably in for a treat to see how he does approach this against the Priest. Uh, the Maligos Druid should just have enough to get through the Priest because they're going to be given time to be able to draw to their combo pieces and then should be able to punch the Priest in the face because the Priest isn't going to be able to get above a life total to really survive. But on the other side, we saw an earlier game where the Priest was able to find just that Alex Straza turn into Mind Blast into Mind Blast with Anduin and that's when it gets really scary. So you do have to be... Uh, well aware of the potential burst damage from the priest. Anduin's having a bit, bit of a weird day today, actually. You're talking about punching priests in the face. Lorinda was talking earlier about Anduin's relationship with Jaina. <laughs> I mean... It's a roller coaster of emotions is, yeah. for Anduin today. Anduin's got it all. It's uh, a lot of problems when you are an 8-drop and you are one of the best 8... Well, he was one of the best cards in the game. Yeah. yeah, I think that's fair. Um, We've got a little bit of time, so we may as well talk through the rest of the series and, and sort of have a look at how we think the whole thing is going to go after Control Priest versus Malagos Druid, which, I mean, it could go either way, right? Like, the Druid does Malagos things, but the Priest does Healy things. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a favorite in that matchup, Dan? Uh, I'd have to go with Malagos Druid. Yeah, Malagos Druid is my favorite. Uh, although, you are right, Priest can do Healy things, uh, so you have to be careful with the damage you are going to output with the Malagos Druid. You might not be able to get them with an OTK, so you need to try and set up for that second turn lethal. So right. I'll go with Malagos Druid in that. All right, so say say Malagos Druid win that one. Malagos right? Druid won that one. Hong Kong Token Druid won the first match. So that's one and one. As we go forward, Agro Mage for Hong Kong versus Odd Paladin for Sweden. Hmm. That's, that's not looking good for the Agro Mage at all. Yeah, I mean, you'd think the Agro Mage would do relatively well because of... Uh, arcane missiles, you've got Cinder Storm. Like with the token druid, then. Does really well against 1 1s, but the Odd Palin just gains too much steam against the Agro Mage, and they just they can struggle. And I say can because if they can get Mana Worm into Sorcerer's Apprentice, into Arcane Missiles, into Frostbolt, then suddenly the Odd Paladin goes, Well, how on earth do I deal with that? Yep. Oh, and before we go any further, I think, I think, in the corner of my eye, I can see a game of Hearthstone starting. No. You're pulling my leg, aren't you? No, I'm not! I was worried it was a test game. I heard five minutes in my ear. That's what I heard. That was too. the quickest five minutes of my life. Debated. All right, let's get on with this. It's going to be Loose Field with the Clerics and Orange with the Ultimate Infestation. Yeah, and now, I know back in the day, there was always that thought of, hmm, do I keep Ultimate Infestation against a slow deck? But you can draw quite considerably with the Malagos Druid, so I don't even know if it's worth even considering now. Well, Orange didn't consider it for long. Nope, threw all that away. But on the other side for the Hong Kong, uh, Clerics are good to have early on, just be able to draw through. Uh, but the rest of it looks pretty meh. Now, I have to admit, Dan, my perspective of Druid recently has actually been that Malagos Druid has been almost the black sheep. Of the, uh, of the Druids. Token Druid seems to have been one of the most popular, if not the most popular deck. And then anything with Togwaggle has been seeing a lot of play. Togwaggle with Malagos and Togwaggle without Malagos has been pretty popular. But it's not too often nowadays that I see just pure Malagos Druid. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems like it comes down to a preference thing. We've even seen Malagos Druid with uh, Azalina thrown in, but no Togwaggle, yeah, for example. That was just, the Hunter Ace tech. Yeah, it's just one of those cards that you put in and you say, well, this is going to help us uh, later on in a matchup, in certain matchups. But Orange has been a fan of the typical 
Maligos Druid. They do have, um, what, what else different is in here? There's a Starfall in here, which is uh, a little bit different. I have seen it in a few, dru a few Druids, which helps out against like Zoo matchups, for example, even though you feel relatively comfortable against Zoo anyway. That extra removal is nice. It's, it's sort of, with Druid though, it's sort of as Sato was saying during HCT uh, play, European playoffs over the weekend, it's the Spreading Plague, Spellstone, Naturalize, Ultimate Infestation deck, Branching Paths deck, it's Druid, right? Yes. Like, all of the Druids run these key cards. And it's the key cards that just do well against certain things. Against Priest, the Malagos Druid, is going to do okay. Its game plan is going to work. There's no way that the priest can interrupt that game plan. Like it's not no demonic project that can suddenly kill off a Maligos, for example, from your hand. So you know you can just focus on that. Uh, similarly, if you were playing Toggle Druid, it can work out fairly well for you. But Psychic Scream can interrupt that plan ever so slightly. So maybe you wouldn't want to run Toggle Druid against a priest. So the the Maligos one will work out relatively well for Orange here. Right? Is it time for this game? to get started, Dan. Are we coining out Twilight Drake? Looks no. good from where I'm sitting. Does it? You don't like it? I mean, I guess you could. But I, th I think the fact that your Twilight Drake has extra health if you don't coin it out. It's true. But you do but have you get to get a second one. You do have to start pushing some pressure at some point. You have to start chipping away at your opponent because otherwise their armor gain is just going to be far too much. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you do just put something on the board here. It's clearly a difficult decision because Hong Kong is still considering it. But there we go, one comes down. And I have to admit, as far as pressure goes, Lucille's hand is looking great. Drake into Drake into later on on turn nine, Twilight Acolyte, Cabal, Shadow Priest is looking like a pretty good way of uh, putting Orange through his paces. And I've not even mentioned the fact that Yes, okay, Orange should be able to find the damage because Loosefield isn't going to be able to get above a life total. But for Sweden, they do have their armor gain. They can get out of range of the burst damage from Hong Kong. So that's why this is an incredibly difficult matchup for the Priest. That's why you do need to be playing this tempo play. You do need to have minions that can find the damage because if you don't, yeah. you're just going to be saying, all right, we've got these Mind Blasts, but they are doing nothing. They're taking my opponent down to, what, like 26 after they've gained all their armor? And the thing is, as well, against Druid, is that all of this chip damage is very important. Druid don't actually have any natural healing. It's all armor gain. Yeah. Which means all of the health damage does count, unlike against the Priest, where if you sort of put the Priest down to 24 and then they heal themselves back up again to 30, it was sort of a waste of time. At the same time, though, the health damage isn't as important before Alex Raza has been played. Because Alex Straza could essentially do exactly what these Twilight Drakes are going to be doing anyway. Right. I think keeping the armor off your opponent mm -hmm. is the key here. But that's that's a whole other that's a whole other debate entirely. The question of sort of how Alex Straza should be used in this matchup: should it be used defensively? Should it be used offensively? Uh, should it be used after Malago? Should it be used before Malago? So there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with that card. <laughs> Should it be flooped out? I floop out my Alex Straza? Played the first one on you or played the second one on me? I mean, I, you'd imagine that Sweden aren't going to be silly enough to put Hong Kong at a life total lower than 15 after their first Maligos. They, they would set up so that uh, Alex Straza couldn't influence the game too much. Uh, but it is definitely something you do have to keep at the back of your mind just in case a mistake is made, for example. But Orange really recognizing the pressure that we are seeing from Hong Kong, and he's just having to play an early plague. Two Scarabs isn't that great, but if it's enough to stop eight damage coming to your face, I think you're going to take it. And it does seem to be enough to stop eight damage coming to the face. The only way that Hong Kong can, can at least push the four is by playing Pyromancer and silencing one of the 1-5s, trading the Twilight Drake into the other, which is now a 1-4, and then going face with the first. But that's... It's quite awkward. It looks like they might be going with it, though. They don't really have much other options. I mean, you could just be using your Cleric to heal up here. You could also heal up with the Cleric alongside this if you want to. I suppose if they're not using the Pyromancer to push for damage or deal with an Arcane Tyrant, then, then what are they going to use yeah. the Pyromancer for in this matchup? And that is one of the ways you approach unfavorable games, is finding the cards that are essentially useless in this matchup and putting them to good use. Mm -hmm. 
So Hong Kong just bested one spreading plague, but as we can see, there is a second one should Orange choose to play it. Things are slightly awkward for Orange now, though, because of that Northshire Cleric. He may decide he actually needs to just deal with that instead. Yeah, which you can, of course. With a, with a spell, Stone and Swipe. You are leaving a uh, Twilight Drake on the board, but just the one minion you're not too concerned about at the moment. You can see very little talking coming from Orange. Uh, of course, he will have his teammates uh, online. They will be chatting to each other, but he's just kind of listening at this point. I imagine he just makes a decision of what he wants to go with, and either they just agree with him or they tell him, no, way, rethink that. I don't know if I'd want to tell Orange to rethink something in Hearthstone. I mean, or is Orange playing on his own at this point? I haven't actually... I mean, I've not focused on it too much, but I haven't seen him mutter even a word. Let's just stare at Orange for the next few minutes. Let's face it, that's what everyone watching is doing. Come hither, the join us, everyone! <laughs> I wonder. But no, very quiet indeed. He's listening intently. Let me change your but I mean, there's not been, like, loads to talk about for this game oh. for Sweden. He definitely said something. He said a word? It may have been a curse word. <laughs> No, yeah. Okay. okay, he's talking. All right, he is chatting. Don't worry, everyone. It is the Hudson Global game. It is a team game. <laughs> but still with the same amount of pressure coming from Hong Kong. It's actually interesting that we talked about that, though. I mean, one of the one of the things we always talk about is how communication is one of the most difficult parts of the Hearthstone Global Games. And I think Orange there really highlighted an important thing about communication, which is only talk when you have something to say. Don't do what we casters do and talk Incessantly. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've spoke to a few teams, or sorry, we've spoke to a few teams now in interviews, and I think one of my common questions usually is, how does a team communicate? I remember the United States said, it doesn't really matter if we're together or if we're online, it's easy to communicate because they're such good friends and they know I'm when to shut up, one. for example. I'm now just imagining what, the host, what us casters would be like in our own Hearthstone Global Games team. Uh, what are we talking? Us four that are currently here, or are we including might, the other might, two? Might as well include the, the four of us, I guess. I mean... I think Darok's a talker. We got the bases covered, though, right? Like, I got the Odd Warrior, he's got the Miracle Rogue. You got the Quester... You got Quest Rogue, right? Yeah, I love Quest Rogue. Rogue. Lorinda's got... Lorinda. Um, yeah. Lorinda's also a talker. I feel like we'd have to be quiet a lot in that team. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> but now Orange forcing forcing himself to use this second spreading plague, so that is his now essentially his last real defensive tool to stop a wired minion heavy board. So if Hong Kong can burst through this, which they do have the opportunity to do with a master spell, maybe they could just keep chipping away. Master Spell just turned the floop into a real boy. I'm a 4-4 now, <laughs> not a 3-4 anymore. It is weird how that interaction works. Yeah. I feel like he should just turn back into floop. Back into right floop? <laughs> Bad transform effects and health stone, I guess. Yep. Oh, Lich King is a really nice draw for Sweden. It's a scary draw. It is a scary draw, especially due to the... Wait, how much... Just going to double check now. Do Hong Kong run two copies of, of Cabal Shadow Priest? Yeah, they do. Okay. In that case, it's very scary because, in theory, Hong Kong only throw the Cabal Shadow Priest out if they have a second one to play. And so Orange has to think about that combo. Well, and what's scarier is Shadow Reaper Anduin. Turn eight. That's scary, too. That's just going to kill you off. There's a lot of scaries. Scary cards. Speaking of scary, can I throw a fact at you? Oh. oh, wait, I don't know if we're ready for this, Dan. You don't know if you're, okay. we're ready in our relationship for fact time? Okay, let's go. Facts for Dan. 
Uh, in Hong Kong, lots of buildings don't have a fourth floor, or at least not a labelled fourth floor. It would just go one, two, three, five. Why is that? Uh, because fourth sounds like the word death, supposedly, in Chinese. <laughs> so they see it as bad luck, so they just remove the fourth floor completely. Ah, interesting. And also interesting, eight is also close to the word wealth. So eight is considered lucky. So do they just have like two eighth floors instead of a fourth floor? Quite possibly. They go one, two, three, eight. I well, five, six, seven, eight. I cannot, oh, wait, I just said four. <laughs> I cannot confirm that as a legitimate fact, but who knows? <laughs> I'll confirm it for you, Dan. Confirmed. Chinese buildings have two eighth floors. So there isn't a shadowy brand. So Sweden will be particularly happy about that. However, there is double dusk break. Nope, just the one, because you only have the one dragon. So maybe Psychic Scream? Or you could just go for uh, a single Dusk Breaker combined with the two hits from the the minions on board. I wonder. Medicine hmm, okay. Not going to give any sort of illusion that this Lich King can be stolen, then just going to go ahead and uh, make a nice big 8-6. We'll just continue the plan of building a, a white board that's scary, and especially now, as I said, Sweden have used both of their spreading yep. up blades. And a swipe. Army of the Dead is extremely interesting. Okay, so Army of the Dead into Maligos. Into swipe. Swipe face. That seems like a good play, but that's... That seems like an emergency plan. That, that is. That, that's the Yogg-Saron of this game. It's the panic button. But your opponent does have 15 on board and a Mind Blast here. So maybe you have a reason, because that could be two Mind Blasts in their hand, and you're just dead next turn. Yeah. But you could just go down the more safe route of playing double branching paths. But that doesn't really get them anywhere, does it? Okay, so then you Army of the Dead, depending on what you get, you can branching pass for armor just to survive if it goes badly, mm -hmm. or you've got the swipe in the Moonfire if you do manage to hit Malagos. Oh, is that really the play they have to make? They don't have to. From where we're sitting, though, it, it, it does look like that's their best chance to win this game. He's hovering over. He's going with it. They he got the Malagos. Okay. Oh, that's so nice for them. They milled a Moonfire there, right? But I mean, they can clear this entire board. They can also send this Moonfire face if they wanted to, but they're opting not to. Well, well, the beautiful thing here is that Psychic Scream doesn't deal with the Malagos permanently. It puts Ooh. it back in the deck again. Uh, so I like keeping the Moonfire in that case, then. Yeah, I guess I'll keep it in Alex Straza and then replay Malagos and then play the Moonfire. Usually the, only, the the main other reason you'd think of keeping Moonfire is so that you can play Floop and then copy the Malagos, but Floop's been used up, obviously, on an Arcane Tyrant this game. So it is all about the Alex Straza. Well, at least Luceville which <laughs> found the situation funny. Which Al Alex Straza can just get slammed down next turn. And Orange's chances weren't that low. It was something like a one in four for him to draw the Malagos there and, and get it played onto the board. Um, but if he had no other chance of winning, then sure, go for it. And now he's going to start ramping up the pressure after seeing that psychic scream. He has Malfurion as a backup. Branching pass potentially doesn't even need to be used as armor gain. It could be just used as card draw because his hand is starting to get a bit thin. And then he can start to get towards Malagos and then he has that Moonfire still available. Struggling to see what Lucefield does about this Alex Straza. There is, there is no answer for it in his hand. His best bet is looking to be just Primordial Drake to try and prevent this damage from going face. Which looks okay. It does. It prevents the Duskbreaker from having an Activator. Which means spiders from Malfurion would be sticking around next turn. Hong Kong, they had such a good game plan, and it was all looking great. <laughs> if Orange hadn't have hit Malagos there, um, Hong Kong were looking at Lich King 2 0. Lich King into Army of the Dead, into Malagos Swipe. It's pretty crazy. Good job, Orange. I mean, he took. The, he knew it was his out. He could have played even slower. He could have just gone for Alex Raza face and said, if they have double Mind Blast, okay, we lose. But if they don't, then maybe that's our way back onto the board. But he felt like that just wasn't a bad... He felt like that was just a bad play.
But now Malfurion being found, and Ferocious Howl. This is the armor gain that I was speaking of earlier on in this game. Suddenly the Mind Blast, Mind Blast plan doesn't look so great. And they've just exhausted their minion advantage plan. The fact that Loosefield hasn't drawn Anduin yet is just really slowing Hong Kong's game plan down this game. They can't really do anything now. Yeah, they need a dragon just to be able to deal with this Alex Draza. Well, a Twilight Acolyte, I guess, can deal with Alex Draza in a way. It does sort of deal with it, so to speak. Uh, Pyromancer Acolyte Mind Blast is another really horrible looking option. I'm pretty sure I prefer the Twilight Acolyte, but that could be played afterwards. If, if Loosefield decides, you know what, I need to start drawing some cards, and I need to start drawing them quick, they could go that route. There would be 14 damage exactly available for Sweden. Yeah. But they are going to go with the card draw. If they get any other cheap spell, a powered shield or something, then uh, they can deal with the Alex Straza easily. That'll do. Yep, Shadow Visions works. At least it deals with Alex Straza. Um, and it stops the potential for lethal next turn for Orange if there were a branching pass. This is a hard choice. Goes with the Mind Blast pretty quick, but... Um, they are nowhere close to winning the game yet. So Mind Blast isn't looking like it's going to do all that much. As Alex Straza's drawn, and then Maligos drawn on the other side. This game is going into turbo mode now. Oh, there's just so many options available for Orange here of how he wants to play this game. Like, everything is screaming out for play it slow, you can gain armor, you can get out of range, you can ruin Hong Kong's game plan, but you've also got this hand where you're like, you can win in two turns. Branching pass for attack is looking very spicy here to me. Uh, that's nine damage to the face with the hero power, and then Malagos Moonfire next turn would be lethal if there were no healing. There would be healing, obviously, so it's a little more complicated than that, but I guess they could well. start with Ferocious House, see what they draw, and then go with Branching Paths. But what was I saying earlier? You what were you saying earlier, Dan? Uh, uh, what was I saying earlier? Where, what was my point? Uh, you don't want to be putting yourself, your opponent, down to a point where Alex Straza then becomes a defensive option. Right. 14 health is a pretty good health total right now, where they know Alex Straza is a possibility at any point. Oh, all right. The big boy himself comes down. But we might not see a Moonfire. Okay, we will see. We're going to see a Moonfire. Alex is gone. There's no reason to hold on to this damage anymore. Orange goes for it. And now, yeah, we may see that defensive Alex Straza again. Uh, it heals for eight. It would put Loosefield out of range next turn. If until not, branching, of course. Yes. Until branching pass, then branching. changes it. But it puts them out of range as far as they're yeah, concerned. Yeah, exactly. And what other options are there? You can just leave this Maligos alive. You've seen both Moonfires. You've seen one swipe. Both swipes, I think. Both swipes. So, so then, so, yeah. yeah, leave him alive. Get rid of its health. Maybe Duskbreaker as well. Oh, I'll just take it. That's my Maligos. Okay, stealing a Malagos when you have Mind Blast's hand is pretty nice, <laughs> but Branch Pass will finish off the game. Yeah. It was a nice, cute play from Loosefield, but unfortunately, Orange is going to get the damage eventually. Uh, I like the Army of the Dead play during the middle of that game. He was rewarded with a Malagos from it. Uh, they tie this up one to one now. Yep, they do. It was as we predicted from the beginning. The Token Druid beat the Aggro Druid, then the Mali Druid. Sorry, beat the Aggro Mage, then the Mali Druid beat the Control Priest. Hey, what do you know? Druid is a good class in Hearthstone right now. It's. An insane class. I think one of the the benefits of an open deck list format is the fact that you can know what Druid you're playing against. When it comes to ladder, things get a little bit more difficult because they play Wild Growth and then they coin out a Nourish and you're like, well, I just have no idea how to approach the rest of this game. What am I playing against right now? Well, as usual, we are two games in and what? Debated, no break, no break. Let's move swiftly on into game number three. That would have been great if I didn't say Blake. Yeah. No Blake, no Blake. I'm sorry that you ruined that one. <laughs> it was looking good thus far. <laughs> Agro Mage versus Odd Paladin coming up next. And Kin, we need to give a big shout out to him as over the weekend, he actually won the Asia games that took place in Jakarta. Oh, wow. And I believe he beat Joth as well, uh, who was on Indonesia. That's right. Uh, in the final. So uh, yeah, congratulations to him. And now he can try and get 
a victory here for Hong Kong against Sweden because taking down Sweden would be a massive victory because we've already said the Swedish team is just a powerhouse. I don't know, Dan. According to Norway, Sweden are a free win, so I'm, I'm really not sure about that. I try not to listen to Norway, but at the same time, they are extremely good. They did predict themselves winning this week, and they broke the curse. <laughs> The first of hopefully a few teams that are going to be able to do that. But yeah, we, we talked about this matchup a lot already. Mm -hmm. How does the uh, how does the Agro Mage win this? That is my, that is my question to you, Dan. Uh, mana Worm is two words, and it can win you the game. Or double Frank. Mana Worm. You mean Frank? Frank. Frank's yes, back. Frank could. Uh, it is doable. It's not like a terrible matchup for the Agro Mage. It's not like one of those 80 20 kind of matchups. There is definitely a chance. Shooting Star makes a big impact here. If you can get Cosmic Anomaly plus a Shooting Star when the Agro Mage has gone a little bit wide, it, it can struggle. Yeah. If the Agro Mage mayor, uh, player sees a Shooting Star, then maybe they can make a wish and win the game as a result. So you really think this is an odd Paladin favoured game? I huh? think it's very, very difficult. For it, the, uh, it is difficult just because of the amount of reload that's available. Any aggressive deck that takes the board away from the aggro mage just mm. sort of leaves the mage in this awkward position where, yeah, okay, they've got fireballs, they've got frost bolts, nothing else goes face. One of the benefits for the mage is the aggro paladin lacks any kind of healing. True. So if they can get that early game and they can get that little bit of burst damage from the get-go, then they do have that potential just over a few turns to go fireball, fireball, frost bolt, and finish the paladin off. I make it sound easier than it is. <laughs> well, we're going to see again, like you said, though, the most important thing is the Mana Worm. If Kin can go Mana Worm into missiles, into cinder storms, into shooting stars, then maybe, maybe they can get what they need to get Sweden off of the board for long enough to deal the damage that they need to win the game. And I always think the Agro Mage Mulligan is one of the most interesting uh, mulligans for me because. Naturally, you want to keep something you can play early on. So a Sorcerer's Apprentice looks nice here. Kirin Tor Mage also plays very well into your secrets. But you want to find those Mana Worms. And it turns oh. out Kin is pretty good at Hearthstone. He wins the Asian Games, and maybe this is why. Okay, double Mana Worm, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Let's go. Game on, Falcone. Game on indeed. Who needs a shooting star anyway? Jam that boy on turn one. Played so quick, it didn't even catch up with the the turn counter there. That was a bit weird. Or go. Boy yes. Or go. Yes. Wait, I can't actually tell which mana worm is which. Uh, that one is Hannah. Oh. Yeah. How did you know that? Just instinct. <laughs> but this is a really awkward for Kenobi. Because you don't really want to play an Acris Veteran just as a 2-1, but you might have to. You also don't really want to coin out your hero power, but you might have to. And they do have the Sacred Maul going for them. It's one of the best, um, one of the best mauls they could get uh, available. But yeah, going with the 2-1 and then hero powering mm. next turn into... You said what? you wanted a shooting star, Dan. How about a mana worm into shooting star to deal with this 2-1 and start sending this damage face? There's actually a lot of options for Kin, though, because Sorcerer's Apprentice shooting star is fine, too. Pinging it, I was going to say, you look really shocked, but I was going to say, this is reasonable, because next turn, if Sweden hero powers, then Hong Kong, go mana worm, Sorcerer's Apprentice shooting star, all in the same turn. Yeah, the, the shooting star has more value on more minions. I mean, that is for sure. You did look like you were going to fall off your chair when you saw the ping there. I mean, I just hate pings because uh, the ability to buff up a mana worm and try and get the damage in now against the paladin is definitely worth considering. But I agree with the eventual play. They are thinking long term, which they do have the advantage of doing. They've not seen an incredible turn one play from Kenobi. So instead, Kin can now say, all right, next turn, maybe we can make Massive power turn. And that's just my face. It wasn't because of fireball. <laughs> I just gen genuinely look like that. You just generally look like you're going to fall off of a chair. Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> so he just don't know what to do then. This is not how this matchup is supposed to go. It's only turn two and we're behind on board. Uh... <laughs> Okay, if you want to know how to play Agro Mage, 
and you've seen you know you, you've seen the somewhat popular deck but you can't get wins with it this is how you play aggro mage i think well someone i i apologize but someone hit legend on my twitter feed today and they said hey i drew a lot of mana worms today <laughs> But this is going to be extremely difficult to come back from on the side of Sweden. That helps. It does. It absorbs two damage, which is helpful. Most importantly, it just allows uh, for a little bit more freedom to draw next turn because you're not facing as much damage. Mm. Just so you know, Dan. Yes. If Kin's next draw is the second shooting star, mm -hmm. I'm leaving the studio. Please be a shooting star. <laughs> Someone save me from Falcone. <laughs> like, I, I don't know that there could be a better anti-paladin start than this. Arcane missiles would also be pretty ridiculous yeah, here. True. Or Cinderstorm, yeah. Cinderstorm. Yeah, there are a few good cards. Yeah, and well, the chances of drawing an Arcane Missiles or a Cinderstorm is probably pretty high at this point. You can see Sweden, they're discussing this because, I mean, you said it yourself, you're not used to being in this position. This is, like, one of the best starts you can have for Mage. You don't expect to see it every single time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there are ridiculous things in Hearthstone. There's Keleseth, there's Egg into uh, Terra Scales, but this is filthy. Sweden just trying to stop and absorb some of that damage as best as possible. I, I was very confused for a second there. For some reason, I was convinced that that was the Divine Shield Maul. I was, I, I was convinced, and I thought, wait, why? Why would you use that on? The okay, yeah, you even called it a Sacred Maul earlier. So I was like, yeah. I mean, but still, even if it, it did the same thing as if it was a Divine Shield Maul, sure, it's a Taunt Maul that's just given Taunt to a minion that has Taunt. But the Divine Shield one is just more valuable, isn't it? Yeah, and Taunt isn't, isn't really. So my bad for saying it's one of the best ones. Apologies, everyone. Well, I thought you were just saying it's Don't pretty me. important because taunts are good against a board like this. I mean, in theory, later on, they could have gone Hero Power into two 1-1 one -one taunts, and that can be somewhat awkward. So I even guess. if you didn't mean to say it, I still felt like there was some reason behind it. Thank Dan. you, Dan. You saved me. Now I don't look silly in front of Twitch chat. I mean, I can't save you from that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Wow. You're expecting... Yeah, wait. Mm, I mean... It, it's complicated, isn't it? I, your natural thought process is, I'm selling this Frostbolt to stop the damage from yep. face, but you're also saying, I want them to hit into my Mana Worm and give my Mana Worm Wind Fury. Yep. The other thing is, by trading the Mana Worm into the minion, the Mana Worm would have taken one damage. I'm not sure if that's really relevant. There's no Consecration or anything in this deck, but... Uh, but yeah, just a little uh, oh my goodness. Bit of intrigue there. Falcone, this just... I mean, I have yeah, to say, you are very firmly in the camp of, of Odd Paladin here. I don't want to rub salt in the wound This here. is not an example of why I'm wrong about this matchup, Dan Gaskin. I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> That's man. not what this is. Just saying you counted my aggro mage out, and I'm saying it's my aggro mage for no reason at all, because you know I <laughs> hate aggro mage. And, but this is why I hate aggro mage. Look how powerful it is! Look how stupid Mana Worms are! Go, Kenobi gives it up. Kin, the winner of the Asia Games, takes the second win for Hong Kong of the series. Uh, looking pretty happy about that. Again, winner of this series does guarantee themselves a place in the top 16 of the Hosting Global Games. Loser of the series is still probably through depending on tiebreakers. Yeah, it, it's frustrating that we do have to say probably, but until we see who beats who, yeah. we can't confirm it with the tiebreakers. And I'm sure the players will be scratching their heads and they'll be trying to work it out as well. Uh, but ultimately, you've just got to focus on your own game, win the, win your series, and then you can put yourself in the best position as possible to get through to that last 16. But only one, maybe two teams are going to miss out. So you are highly likely with four wins to get through. Should we take a look at what is coming up Next, it's going to be... What is it going to be? It's going to be Odd Rogue for Shy versus Control Priest for Arcade. Okay. Well, this is one of those matchups where I think it's all about speed. Odd Rogue is going to want to deal that early damage, get those early hench clan thugs down and start dealing and start with the pressure. Um, Priest is just going to want to survive, get the Twilight Drakes down, start to defend themselves, and then I guess heal up with Divine Hymns and try and survive. But I've got to say, in this matchup, I'm, uh, I'm Camp Odd Rogue. 
okay, just don't trust his camp, uh, because we saw what happened in the last one. But yeah, Odd Rogue, it, it can just push through too much damage, and the Priest can struggle. But Pyromancer, Duskbreakers, they can put a real halt to the plan of trying to find damage for the Odd Rogue. But if, if the Odd Rogue is able to get to that turn 5, have a couple of minions, and then Fungalmancer comes down, the damage can be too much sometimes for the Priest. But it, it's going to be a close one. It's going to really come down to those those mulligans, which of course are very important. And uh, As we saw as in we the learned. last game, where mulliganing into two mana worms is... Uh... It's a pretty good mulligan. And you can see the celebration in, from them in that game as well, when they hit both the mana worms. It's nice when you hit one mana worm, but when you hit two, it's just double bubble. Double bubble. Mm. Frank and Hannah. Yeah, the two good mana worms. And They're Paul. friends of us. Where is Paul today? He's there. I haven't actually seen Paul. He's chilling. Oh, he's chilling. That's, we're in, we're in close-up shot at the moment, so we can't, we can't see Paul. But yeah, Paul's there. Paul is there. He's your good friend, isn't he? Paul is always here in the HGG studio. He's become a very valued part of the show but uh, you can uh, follow him on twitter as well <laughs> you can yeah it's, uh, i think it's at p murloc it's not a very popular twitter but you can follow him <laughs> with you your help want to yeah with your help it could be a popular twitter feels like a donation <laughs> it feels like a charity at this point please follow paul <laughs> uh sweden <laughs> will be scared though dan uh because wow. we were talking about tiebreakers they did get a buy in the last round yes and typically when you get buys your tiebreakers become a little bit worse because yes. you didn't play anyone uh, so they will want to get back into this series. And if they do get back into this series, it's Death Rattle Hunter Mirror. Uh, it's not. I was... Actually, check your notes, Dan Gaskin. I believe it's Death Rattle Hunter on Hong Kong side versus... Oh. Get out of here. Versus Subject 9 Hunter uh, on the other side. So you're close. Good uh, class. Well, to be honest, I am a bit biased with Hunter, and I usually look at Hunter and go, eh, it's Death Rattle. Yeah, well, honestly, up until this week, that's been, like, the correct play in the whole of the Hearthstone Global Games, because every time I've looked at a list to note down which class it is, which archetype it is, it's been, yep, Hunter, Hunter, Death yeah. Rattle, Hunter, great. But this week, we've seen two Subject 9 Hunters today already. <gasps> Blasphemy. Yeah. People starting to edge away from their comfort zones, it would seem. It's ball control. It's all ball control's fault. Yeah, and I mean, I know there's been some talk around, like, who invented the Subject 9 Hunter? Is it ball control's list? Is it, who it isn't? I know players, they, they like to credit the right people, but certainly from my point of view, the first time I saw it was ball control. Yeah. Um, well, but if I, anyone else did make it, credit to them. Well, I, I think Lorenzo was pointing out earlier on today, another player another player sort of made the base of the deck and then bore control, as he's done with every single Hunter deck, has gone, ooh, I think Subject 9 could go in this deck. And it did, and it worked, and that's where this deck came from. So it was like a magical cake. Yes. It began with the base. It was like a crust, like breadcrumb. No, not breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. Like biscuit crumbs. Okay. And then bore control came along and just slapped some cheesecake on top of it. Slaps a subject nine in it. Yeah. Yep. Sounds pretty juicy. Cheesecake's good. All right, game number four then, and Hong Kong's chance to 100% qualify for the last 16 is going to be on this odd rogue. And we were saying the mulligan's extremely important. Uh, it's not so bad. A die mole and cold blood with a weapon. All Shy really needs is a hench clan thug. And he should be in a good position to deal a lot of that early damage. Arcade looking for that Dusky Boy. Yeah, Dustbreaker going to be really important, but... It... There it is. Oh, okay. yeah, he's there. But Dustbreaker doesn't kill off a Clown Thug if a Clown Thug is a 4-4. Four, four. So you said a Clown Thug there. Uh, they are just a scary thing you don't want to know about Clown Thugs. New there. Hearthstone card. Hench Clown Thug. It begins as a 7-7, seven, seven, and every time you attack, it gets worse and becomes a 6-6, six, six, then a 5-5, five, five, then a 4-4. Four, four. How much? What's the mana cost? Uh, three. Three mana, seven, seven. Yeah, it's a clown thug, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of clown thugs, we found the clan thug for shy. Um, so yeah, I mean, just hero power into clan thug is the obvious way of going with the next couple turns, but he could go coin clown thug and then cold blood hero power the turn after. There's loads of different ways he could do this. Uh, but the fact that it, the Clown Thug can get above the health total to survive a Duskbreaker mm -hmm. is relatively exciting for Hong Kong. But the problem is, is how they then kill off the Duskbreaker so that the Duskbreaker can't just trade in <laughs> right, right. with the remaining Clown Thug. I do like the uh, the Cold Blood this turn. Oh, yeah. Honestly, like any any opportunity you have as Odd Rogue to, to combo out a Cold Blood on turn two onto a Diamond. I mean, it's a two mana five three. That's a, I'd play that card in my deck. 
Would you also play a card that steals the attack from that 5-3 and gives it to yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'd play that. Yeah, I, it seems pretty good. And this is why the priest can do quite well against I mean, Dr. Rogue. I mean, a Twilight Acolyte is a 3-mana 5-4. That's even better than a 5-3. It's got 4 health. Uh, factually, that is correct, yes. And no production, that is not one of my facts before they add it to the counter. Uh, but at least now Shai can trade off still. Yeah. Uh, because he was able to equip the weapon, and now this 4 4 is a little bit awkward. And Oh, okay. Twilight Drake maybe changes your uh, your game plan here for Arcade. It's only got 5 health, though. No, it hasn't. It's got 6 health. What am I talking about? I forgot about the 1 health it starts with. <laughs> like it has 1 plus the 5 in hand. I wonder, things like that, like Twilight Drake and Whispering Woods, sometimes I do have to just double check and, and recount time and time again. Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure. Because I, admittedly, ever since Hearthstone added the feature where you just hover over your deck and it tells me tells you how many cards you have, mm -hmm. it's made me slightly lazier for how good my counting <laughs> oh, of cards are. I use that all the time. I'm dragging my mouse over my deck every turn. But not when casting, because we, we don't have decks to hover over. <laughs> Don't have that ability. We don't have mice or decks. One day. Or oh, numbers. And it's when this Void Ripper is going to come into the equation for Hong Kong as well. Oh, Void Ripper's looking really good this turn, actually. It would mean sacrificing the Hench Clown Thug, which ideally Shy would want to be sticking around for a long time. But if he doesn't Void Ripper this turn, the Hench Clown just gets killed off anyway. So. Void Ripper make the trade, end up with a 1-2 and a 3-3 three, three on board. So many Seems reasonable. Options. Yeah, but this game isn't looking particularly pleasant for the odd rogue at the moment. From the hand that we can see available for Sweden. And uh, if Hong Kong do keep you, if they keep using their face to take some of this damage, they'll be naturally chunking themselves down and making themselves vulnerable to that oh, mind blast oh. plan that is going to be eventually coming through from Sweden. But th there isn't really another option here for Shai. No, I'm trying to work it out. There just isn't. Has he found? He's found another option anyway, though. He's going to try and keep this hench count alive. It does get the slight buff, so at least it's not dead on board. And it seems like an underwhelming turn, but the re-dagger is extremely important for the odd rogue. That extra two damage every turn is going to be really nice. You know what else is really nice? Um, I'm going to guess something with pink hair, slightly uh, purple, mouth open, eyes white. Did you say pink hair? Is that how you started that? Yes, that is pink hair. Shall I reap around doing? Oh. Unless you're looking at something else. I was looking at Duskbury. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because then you said slightly purple mouth, and it's like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Duskbreaker does have a slightly purple mouth. <laughs> I thought Shadow Reaper Anduin was also a, a pretty nice draw here because it does play into the same plan of Mind Blast will eventually just kill my opponent. Should we just agree that both Shadow Reaper Anduin and Duskbreakers are pretty nice? I'd say all cards here that have any sort of purple, pinkish tint are quite nice. What's wrong with Primordial Drake? It's a bit boring, isn't it? A bit plain. Oh, yeah, okay. Primordial Drake was the card for quite some time, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Um, but now it's really fallen out of favor. Mm. I mean, I'm not, and to be to be honest, to be quite frank, I feel like this Control Priest deck is aged. It's ancient. We need something new. It's kind of just been shoveled over from the Witchwood meta and just plopped into the HTG meta because people are like, well, we have to bring Priest. What I would like to see is a Priest deck that's focused around summoning a lot of Stone Tusk Boars and raising their health up to something like six, I, 64, 128, then playing another card to flip the attack and health. Doesn't ring a bell. And then multiply the boars and hit several times. I feel like you purposely remind me of this every time just because we had a show match and you managed to pull off the combo and I didn't. I wasn't I wasn't even going to bring that up, Dan. Yeah, but, yeah. but as you did, I yes. I see it in your eyes. We did it on mobile. <coughs> it's an important fact. Hello. Hello. You can see Shy is just having to take this damage every turn to his face. And Sweden will just be happy about that, I think. But they don't want to get ahead of themselves. Even though the final plan is certainly 
within touching distance. They need to be very careful that they don't just allow Hong Kong to burst through because the burst damage available for Odd Rogue is extremely scary. Yes, one Cold Blood has been used, so you've only got to worry about uh, Leroy plus one Cold Blood. But that's still 10 coming out of hand. This game is definitely looking worse and worse for Shy, though, as it goes on. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, Arcade has to think about the burst damage, but as Shy's hand gets smaller and smaller, there's there's much less of a threat. Are they even running Myra's Unstable? Yeah, they are running Myra's Unstable Element. Okay, so that's something. There is a backup plan when they run out of cards. But the important factor here is how do they deal with this board? Well, the answer is they can't actually deal with this board. Instead, they're just going to have to heal up and put some stuff down to try and combat it over the next few turns. Firefly is not the draw. Well, you say it's not the draw, Dan. Combos into, into Vast Point Slayer. Yeah. But something I should have brought up a couple turns ago is that one of the reasons I didn't love the uh, the play before, with instead of the Void Ripper, the Firefly Flame Elemental Hench Clan Dagger in play, was because it gave up all of the one drops and prevented anything mm. to combo into Vast Point Slayer. So I guess, yeah, Hong Kong are pretty lucky they've managed to now redraw into a one drop that can combo into it. You are going into your opponent's uh, turn seven, though. So that is a Psychic Scream turn, so you are committing heavily into this board if you are going to go Firefly into Vilespine. Mm. I mean, the Giggling events are naturally trades into the 3-2. That's pretty comfortable. It's what you but, do, therefore, after. Well, it depends, doesn't it? Like, if they expect there to be a Psychic Scream played next turn, then I think everything just goes face. Yeah, it, it's a weird one, right? It's a weird dance, because if you play a lot of minions, you expect a Psychic Scream, but if you hold back your minions, then you're not expecting a Psychic Scream. All right. A dance with these dragons. But Void Ripper is a nice little middle ground. It pushes this damage with the Annoyatrons, damage you typically wouldn't be able to find, and also baits out a potential Psychic Scream. But there is no Psychic Scream, Falcone. Void Ripper just impresses me every single time I see it played in a game like this. Do you know why? Why? Purple card. Is there something I'm missing here? Like, is that genuinely the secret to Hearthstone? Just yes. purple cards are best cards? Yes, it is, Valkyrie. Okay. Mm. I'm going to go rebuild some decks. Shadow form. Great card. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, can we address the fact that Sweden are really struggling now at this point? They have no removal. Are they having to use a cleric just to draw? Are they that much backs against the wall? Because naturally, I'm looking at Holy Fire. Holy Fire off one of these three threes, you heal yourself up to 17. I'm just really trying to spot the purple and giggling inventor. <laughs> uh, right there, her right hand, I believe. <laughs> the little drill she's got. Yep. Okay, great. Sorry, yes, the game. Um, Sweden are in trouble. For sure, 17 health, and as you said, the damage is starting to stack up. Ooh. That's Leroy Jenkins drawn off the top there. That's 12 damage, 13, 14 damage with the weapon. Three off lethal. Cold Blood would have done it here. No, it wouldn't, because they would have not been the mana to play the weapon on the Cold Blood. And even though the dagger into killing off the 6 2 looks nice, again, that is taking a lot of damage uh, for Shy, but he hasn't seen any uh, Shadow Vision, so he knows there's not going to be three Mind Blast in the hand. So maybe you are comfortable taking that 6 and setting yourself up for lethal next turn. Yep. Shellery Paranduin will allow healing back up to 16, which would just be enough to keep them alive. Unless you play a double Firefly. If you play Double Firefly here as Shy, you can bash through all of that 16. Hmm. Do it. <laughs> you probably keep back one is the problem. Yeah. yeah you have right. to for Valspine. Yeah, I mean, keeping back more cards is also better for a uh, Psychic Scream drawn off the top, though it would have to be drawn off the top, as if Sweden had a Psychic Scream already, they would have played a Psychic Scream already. But this Primordial Drake, uh, it works out for Sweden, certainly from their end. We can see that there is a Vile Spine. It's real nice this turn, though. Dealing with everything except the Void Ripper. 
Then after Valspine, only the Void Ripper and the weapon push space, so it, it does buy Arcade some time. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't heal, which is uh, a bit of a problem. This 11 health isn't fantastic. It means that next turn for Hong Kong, if the Promodio Drake does come down, they can Valspine off the Promodio Drake, they can push another 5, take their opponent down to 6, and then they have Leroy Jenkins just waiting in the wings for his moment. He does often have his moment. Must be one of the highest percentage played win rates in Hearthstone, given that it's only ever really played when they have lethal. It's the sad times when you don't have lethal with Leroy Jenkins and you have to play him just as a removal, which <laughs> I have seen quite a lot, especially with zoo variants lately that have been running Leroy Jenkins instead of the Doom Guards. Right. When the zoo player wishes it was a Doom Guard. Yep. Wish wishes they'd listen to Lorinda and put Doom Guards in their zoo decks. I mean, generally, I try and live my life not listening to Lorinda, mm. but sometimes you do just have to. Well, he says a lot of things. Yeah, it's not all right. You'd have to be very contrary to disagree with everything oh, Lorinda ever yeah. says, because he says pretty much everything ever. Yeah. Uh, but this Vastbind Slayer looks too juicy to pass up. I can't see any reason why you wouldn't play it. And so Shadow Reaper Random would only take you up to 11 once again. Yeah. yeah, this is so nice being able to push the five damage. And like you said, up to 11 doesn't remove anything off of the board. And you're just dead? Yes. Shadow Priest though, heal up doesn't save you. They don't know they're just dead, though. Oh, they, no. They don't know there's Leroy in hand. However, the leftmost card has now been held onto for a long time. That Baku could easily be a Leroy. It could be. A and the Leroy itself could also be a Leroy. Yeah, you, usually when you get to this point in the game as well, especially against Odd Rogue, you presume the worst. You presume that, I mean, they would only even need just a Cold Blood, I believe, to find lethal uh, if Shadow Reaper Randowin is played. Uh, so you might need to be looking at other options. Maybe you could even go for a Power Word Shield here uh, to look for what? A uh, Psychic Scream? It, it, psychic Scream keeps you alive from Cold Blood. Doesn't give you a life from Leroy, but that's one of the two things. Divine him. Hmm. Well, that does keep them alive. That puts them on 14 health. Wait, does that keep them alive? No, it doesn't keep them alive. I take it back. It looks like Hong Kong just going to take this Let one. Yeah, they're going to go for the Shadow Priest and the Divine him. But Hong Kong know what's up. They know they've got that victory. That takes them to the five wins that they needed, Falco. Amazing. Hong Kong now guaranteed their place in the top 16. Uh, Sweden not looking too happy about that, actually. They should still be through. Make no mistake, Sweden probably still in an okay position here. But today, it's all about Hong Kong, their victory, and their better, better seeding in the top 16. And I've got to give a shout out to them for taking the amount of face damage that they did. Yeah. They were not afraid to just uh, disappear some of that life total of theirs. They weren't scared of Mind Blast and they were able to find Lethal because of it. A very well played game from Hong Kong there. Well played game, well played series as we take a look once more Once more, how it went down. There you go. Blitzchung took the first game. Orange managed to win one for Sweden, but unfortunately for Sweden, Hong Kong were able to win the rest of the games, not even getting to that fifth and final Hunter Mirror. Now, Sweden will be hoping that some of those teams who are on a worse tiebreaker than them coming into this round lose their matches. I believe Belarus might be one of those teams that are on a pretty poor tiebreaker, so Sweden will probably be hoping that they find a loss just to make sure that they do get into that top 16. But you're right, they should be there. But if they were able to get a victory, they would have been there, and that's the big difference. Big difference between should and would there. Should, woulda, coulda. Uh, let's take a look at some of the best moments of the series and uh, remind ourselves just how it happened. Wow, okay, that's that's lethal right there. Well, and uh, this was a demonstration of how quick this game was for the uh, token druid and how miserable it was for Sweden. Yeah, uh, then we had the Malagos druid with Orange managing to get his victory because of the army of the dead into the Malagos, into the swipe, which was uh, pretty disgusting, actually. 
which and it was a shame for Hong Kong because this was another very well piloted game as well. They were able to just try and focus on their win conditions, and if there wasn't a Maligos found, I feel like this was a victory for Hong Kong. Yeah, and again, it was just over a one in four chance to find that Maligos, so um, not, not the. Uh... Not a guaranteed win by any means, as Orange eventually did win thanks to branching paths. Yeah, even though his Maligos got stolen and Loosefield was so, like, cheery about it because it was such a little cute play, he wasn't able to survive. And then we had your favorite game, Dan. We had yeah. Mana Worm <sighs> Stone. Mana Worm Stone. Frank and Hannah Stone. The Paladin just struggling to keep up with the sheer amount of pressure from the Mana Worms that were drawn from the Mulligan which then put Hong Kong in this position, an ad advantageous position going into game number four. And then they found the victory to guarantee themselves into top 16. Yep, top 16 is just such a great position. It's what everyone has been aiming for over the first six weeks of the Hearthstone Global Games. Things are going to kick into overdrive next week as we begin double elimination and start to narrow it down to the top eight. But for now, it's all about top 16. It's all about Hong Kong. And right now, it's all about Shy as we have a chat with him. Shai, congratulations for your win against Sweden. Guaranteed top 16 now. Uh, how are you guys feeling about that? Yeah, I had a feeling. I agree. I had a feeling. I'm not the best lip reader here. I had a feeling that we couldn't hear them. Let's, we'll try again in a minute, Shai, okay? Just, just hang, hang tight, tight. It's always a shame. Modern day internet and we still can't get an interview. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sadly that happens. It's the difficulty of trying to communicate with all of these different teams and all of these different countries all over the world. Sometimes technology stutters a little bit. It does a little bit. It's like that you see those famous sports interviews where they say, how are you doing over there, Hank? And Hank's there like... Yeah, right, right, nothing, right, 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 right. Absolutely nothing. And that's even more painful, I would have to say. Okay, well, it looks like we are done for this series. But coming up, we are only halfway through the day. Three sets down, three to go. Plenty more eliminations to happen here in the HGG studio.